All right, welcome everybody to our webinar today where we will be covering Spanish language Eclipse resources. Um, so everything we are sharing today has a bilingual component in English and Spanish. Um, and it's all about creating solar science programs for your activities or things you can use for the upcoming eclipse this April, the total solar eclipse on April 8th. Um, we do have a link bank that has links, direct links to all of the resources that we'll be covering during this webinar. Um, so uh, we'll go ahead and kind of drop that in the chat throughout the, the webinar so you can access these resources after the webinar. Um, so quick introduction, my name is Claire Ratcliffe Adams, my pronouns are she, her, and I am an education associate at the Space Science Institute. Um, and our other facilitators today are Dylan Connolly, um, and we have our uh, education specialist who did all this, the translations for us, um, Beatrice. So we're excited to be here with you today. Um, we're going to quickly do an icebreaker before we dig into the content. Um, and then we'll talk about resources that are ready to just share with the public. So these are things you can um, directly share with your patrons. So some videos, some books um, that are just like ready to go for uh, public education. Uh, next, Dylan is going to go over all of our bilingual hands-on activities and just a, a quick description of um, how you can use those in your programs. Um, we'll end with a couple of STEM tools. So uh, Sunspotter um, that we've created a Spanish translation for um, and also a constellation card that you can turn into a pinhole projector with your patrons. And we'll end with a QA. and a um, Again, use the chat to ask any questions that you might have um, or share other activities or resources that you think will be helpful for folks leading bilingual or Spanish programs related to the eclipse. All right, so we'll start with this icebreaker. Um, if you've been in our webinars recently, you might have done this, uh, this icebreaker before, but that's okay. We can revisit it and see how you're feeling today. Maybe it's different, um, but I'd love for you to share in the chat. What solar feature do you feel like today? So are you a sunspot, you know, relatively cool, calm and collected, embracing change and transition? Are you a solar prominence, kind of feeling showy and bright, but still grounded and connected? Are you a coronal mass ejection? Now this is powerful, you're influential, you're ready to mess things up. Maybe you wanna, you know, take out a satellite of earth. Or are you the sun's corona, maybe sassy and gassy, and you won't let anyone's shadow dim your light? So go ahead and answer in the chat. How are you feeling today? A little check-in. All right, we've got a solar prominence, a bunch of sunspots. That's good. All right, coming out of a holiday weekend, you're, you're, you're staying cool today. We've got, you know, MR wants to mess things up. Maybe you're feeling a little powerful today. That's great. Dylan says they're feeling like the corona today. <laughs> and not just because he's dreaming about the corona you're going to have at the end of the day today. <laughs> Maybe a little, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling a little bit like the sun's corona today as well. I had some uh, tech issues early this morning, so I was just panic drinking coffee and you know that definitely makes me a little sassy and gassy so awesome <laughs> all right well thanks for participating in this icebreaker you're absolutely welcome to steal any of the content from these slides you can even um, you'll be able to access these slides on the Starnet's <clears throat> webinar archive page so if you want to use this in any of your eclipse or solar science programs to get youth or families you know uh, give them a chance to express how they're feeling while also adding a little bit of solar science content. You're welcome to use this icebreaker. All right, so I wanted to start off with a few resources for you to share. You can just share directly with the public in your programs. Um, the first is a, a video that the Fisk Planetarium in Boulder, Colorado put together. Um, they put together a series of videos leading up to the eclipse. There's also one all about the annular eclipse, which took place in October of 2023. 
Um, but we're going to share this about five minute video about the total eclipse of the sun, um, which is something you can just plug into your programs. If you don't feel like you're an expert in what's happening with the total solar eclipse, this is a great video that um, describes what's going on, um, why we get so total solar eclipses. Um, it also adds a lot of excitement. When I was watching this last night, putting together the slides, I got so excited for the upcoming total solar eclipse. Um, it has footage from the 2017 eclipse of people being so excited. Um, so, you know, this can be an inspirational video. Um, and this video does come in Spanish as well. And the great thing about the Spanish version is it's not just uh, Spanish subtitles. They actually have scientists speaking in Spanish, describing what's going on. So it's a really wonderful bilingual resource you can use for English speaking patrons as well as Spanish speaking patrons. So we'll go ahead and uh, play the video and get started. got suspended. It was very surreal. Everyone was going crazy. It was awesome. Pretty cool. If something dramatic happens like this, it resonates inside of us because we're part of this universe. Oh, that was mind-blowing. That was so cool. I almost, first eclipse, I almost didn't know where to look. I was watching the mountains disappear as the shadow came. I was watching the shadow bands on the ground. I watched the corona, the prominences, the planets you could see. It was, oh, that was the fastest two and a half minutes of my life. Something awesome is coming. Two eclipses of the sun are crossing the U.S. in October of 2023 and April of 2024. Everyone in North America will see at least part of the sun covered by the moon. The first eclipse is an annular or ring of fire eclipse. And the second one is an awesome total eclipse of the sun. Let's talk about the total eclipse. I'm astronomer Doug Duncan, and I have been chasing eclipses my whole career. And I'm astronomer Jimmy Negus, and I saw my first total solar eclipse in 2017. We are here to show you how to watch an eclipse safely. If you want to look at the sun, you must, must, must protect your eyes. These are not sunglasses. They're a thousand times darker, and they're made for looking at the sun. Tens of millions of people have used these to safely watch eclipses. And during an eclipse, it takes the moon a little over an hour to cover the entirety of the sun. Depending on where you live, you'll see more or less of the sun. The only time you can look at the sun without eclipse watching glasses is if you're in the path of totality during just the few minutes when the moon completely covers the sun. So it's really interesting, right, to see a partial eclipse, but you went to the total eclipse. How was that? Absolutely. So the total eclipse, if you have the opportunity to see, is absolutely worth it. It is very stunning and sends chills down your spine. You will remember it your entire life. Hi, my name is Christian Greer, President and CEO of the Michigan Science Center here in Midtown Detroit. On August 17, 2017, I was in rural Missouri on the center line of a total solar eclipse. And I'm there with my family, and I told them all about the eclipse. You know, it's going to be this incredible thing, and it's going to be awesome. So my wife is like, yeah, 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 you know, like, you've been talking about this forever. We're finally here. So she goes up, and we start watching the eclipse happen, and all the things are happening us around us. And my wife is just like, oh, wow, wow. Oh my God, this is incredible. I'm like, I told you, I've been talking about this for five years. This is an incredible experience. <laughs> but sometimes it takes people the opportunity to actually go and see the eclipse. It's so cool to see, and it's something that I think is a lot of fun and something you won't forget. I was in a huge crowd. Some people were screaming in amazement. Other people were struck silent in awe. Their mouths were literally hanging open. I did both. The first time I saw an eclipse totality, I have to be honest with you, I cried. I had emotional moment of just the awe 
of what I was seeing, the darkness around me, the animals that were coming out. It was unbelievable. You're incredible. Unreal. <laughs> yeah. Well, I hope that video got you excited. Um, you know, even if you're not on the path of totality, it's still just an incredible experience. Um, and I also just want to point out, you know, even if your library is not on the path of totality, you may have patrons traveling to totality and want to learn more and get some resources. So uh, that's just a fun video you can have in your lobby or during a program um, to give that science content. <clears throat> So in the link bank, we have a list of books that are, most of them are in Spanish, um, but uh, many of them are in English and Spanish. I'm just highlighting two in the webinar today um, that we put in our NASA at my library um, solar science kits that we sent out to about 50 libraries around the country that applied for it. Um, but these books were recommended by our library advisors for books that just are really great um, for th this first one, El Cielo y el Espacio, is really great. Um, it's not just about the solar the solar eclipse, but it has all kinds of other astronomy and, and space science content in it <clears throat> at a really accessible level for youth. So um, if you have Spanish-speaking youth and you want to get them excited about the eclipse and also astronomy at large, this is a really great one. Um, also, Star Stories by Anthony Aveni. So this is not in Spanish, this is in English, but this explores stories about constellations and cosmology and ways of knowing about uh, our universe um, from cultures around the globe. Um, and our advisor from the San Antonio Public Library recommended this book, um, and they even had the author come give a program at their library. So it's just a really fantastic book to dig into other cultures. Um, but in the link bank that uh, we are putting in the chat, there's a whole list of other books all about um, solar science, the total solar eclipse um, that are available in English and Spanish for a variety of different age groups. So if you want to put together a book display, uh, these are just some resources that we have found be really, really helpful. And the last kind of book resource I want to let you know about is our guide to the solar eclipses of the annular of 2023 and the total of 2024. Um, this is a guide we put together <clears throat> specifically for libraries, um, but there are some patron facing sheets in it in English and Spanish that you can just print out um, that has all kinds of information about the science, um, what's going on, why we're getting eclipses, why we don't get eclipses every month. Um, and so that's just something you can copy and print out and have on your reference desk um, available in English and Spanish for patrons. But you can download this um, on the Starnet website and the link to download this book in English and Spanish is available on the link bank. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dylan to walk you through our bilingual hands-on activities. Thank you so much, Claire. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about uh, several different activities that are available in the Solar Eclipse Activities for Libraries uh, cl uh, collection on the STEM Activity Clearinghouse. Everything we're going to be talking today is available in both English and Spanish, and we are also have links to all of this in the link bank that Beatrice is sharing out in the chat repeatedly throughout today's webinar. So be sure to bookmark that link bank if you want to refer back to any of the resources that we're talking about today. Claire, could you move on to the next slide? So as I said, uh, all of these activities are available on the STEM Activity Clearinghouse. It's available from Starnet. Um, if you're not familiar with the STEM Activity Clearinghouse, it's available at clearinghouse.starnetlibraries.org. It is a uh, huge repository of over 500 vetted uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics activities uh, designed uh, or vetted specifically for deployment in informal learning environments, uh, libraries in particular. 
Um, all of these activities have been uh, tested, uh, reviewed, are gathered from uh, vetted sources. Uh, so it's a really, really great resource uh, for finding uh, not just resources and activities for the Eclipse, uh, but for any STEM-related programming you might be doing at your library uh, at any time in the future. Uh, can we move on to the next slide? So when you get to the Clearinghouse, we have what are called featured collections. We put together kind of themed collections uh, as we do different projects. Uh, right here, you can see uh, this is what's currently up there. Um, we have projects around water, um, about the James Webb Space Telescope, the Artemis program and Moon, Mars and Beyond. And if you'll move on to the next slide, uh, you'll see that we have one that's actually an activity collection that's entirely about solar ac uh, eclipse activities for libraries. Uh, this collection contains uh, activities not just about the eclipse, but about solar science in general. Um, as uh, After the eclipses, NASA is also uh, doing a ton of stuff around heliophysics or solar physics this year um, with uh, results coming in from the Parker Solar Probe, uh, as well as some other uh, solar citizen science projects. Uh, so we have a ton of resources in there if you wanted to use the excitement from the eclipse um, to uh, do some STEM programming all about the sun, not just for the eclipse, but for the rest of the year. This is a great jumping off point uh, for you to start with. Um, so when you go into that collection, <clears throat> you'll see many, many different uh, activities uh, on the clearinghouse, actually. There's a searchable, filterable option for uh, finding all of our bilingual activities, but every single, um, or almost every single activity in the SEAL collection has been translated into Spanish. Um, it has full Spanish versions. Uh, everything we've developed um, for these activities, whether or not it has a table sign, uh, a patron facing handout, uh, anything like that has been translated and has a separate version in Spanish that you can use uh, for programming. So all of these activities that I'm going to be talking about have instructions in both English and Spanish uh, for both you and your patrons. So the first activity we're going to be talking about is a really cool demo. This is uh, the first couple activities we're going to be talking about are some cool demonstrations that use some everyday objects uh, to show how the, the relationship between Earth's position, the moon, and the sun create eclipses. Um, so if you're thinking about how eclipses would work, it's the shadow of the moon passing over the Earth and blocking the sun. Uh, so uh, that is reliant on the very specific distance between the Earth and the moon and then the moon and the sun. Um, if the moon was a little bit further uh, away from us, it, the shadow wouldn't cover the sun completely. Uh, and if it was a little closer to us, we would pro we would have even more of a dramatic. You wouldn't see the corona, the sun's shadow, would, or the moon shadow would cover even more of the sun uh, than it is. Also, the moon being closer to the Earth would mean massive tidal uh, events and probably the Earth being ripped apart by the moon's gravity. So we're very glad that we have eclipses the way they are. Um, <laughs> uh, so this activity uses uh, two learners, a plate, and a large coin like a quarter. Uh, uh, a half dollar, if you've still got any Sacagawea golden dollars running around from 20 years ago, uh, this is a, a good use for that. Um, and this activity positions two learners, one of whom is holding uh, a coin and looking at the coin, and another learner who moves further away from them holding a plate, and you uh, to try and determine the exact distance that the second learner has to move away uh, from the uh, learner in order for that plate to be covered up completely as they're looking through the coin. And this kind of mimics how the moon passes in front of uh, the, the, between the earth and the sun to create that shadow and blocks the sun's light. Uh, so you do that and it's a very simple setup. It's a really good to do in groups because it's uh, easy to pair off everyone and demonstrate this all at once. You can have people make predictions about how far they need to be away uh, before the eclipse uh, of the paper plate happens. Uh, and it's a really uh, cool, fun activity. Can we move on to the next slide? So this is a diagram, a very simple diagram that's actually included uh, in the uh, activity um, that shows uh, how kind of the exact positioning that needs to happen for the moon to be in front of the sun to create a total eclipse. Um, when it's not in the co exact correct position, you get what's called a partial. Um, this is what also creates the path of totality um, that uh, was shown in that video. Um, the path of totality is where that position of the moon is relative to the uh, to the Earth, where it creates a total shadow. And the path of totality is actually the area where that shadow is going to travel across the Earth's 
uh, surface, creating a diameter of complete coverage where you can see the total shadow. If you're outside of that path of totality, you get the partial um, uh, eclipse, which you can kind of see um, on the right side of that diagram, that lighter gray area uh, is where partials would happen, where there's a partial shadow instead of the total. Um, so that's a really simple demonstration uh, and activity that's got uh, those uh, instructions in Spanish, and it pairs really nicely with the next activity we're going to be talking about, um, which is shadow tracing. These don't need to be done together, but they pair really, really nicely together to show um, not just about how the distance of the sun, uh, earth, and moon are uh, important for eclipses to happen, but also that the sun and the, um, the those relative positions change uh, as the orbit of the the earth travels around the sun as the orbit of the moon travels around the earth um, and specifically how the angle of the sun relative to us creates different types of shadows and helps create that path of totality. Um, so this is a really great indoor or outdoor activity. Uh, it's really great for outdoors on a sunny day, but if you plan to do this for any programming, it's really easily adaptable in line by using a uh, light indoors. Uh, any kind of lamp will work for this, especially if you've got one uh, that has something you can direct light, like as a conical uh, kind of uh, light shape. One thing that works really well is those uh, Ikea or Walmart um, lamps with the five tendrils on the top of it with the uh, kind of spotlights on them where you can direct those five lights in any direction. Um, those work really well for that if you're looking to get a lamp for this or like $20 at Target or something. Um, so all you want to do is set up a light source, whether or not it's the sun or a lamp, uh, and tr use a part of your body, whether or not it's your whole body, a hand, uh, and you want to put that um, your that body part, your hand, your your whole body in a position and mark that position, right? And then you're going to trace onto some paper or uh, using pen and paper uh, if you're indoors or chalk if you're outdoors uh, to shape uh, to trace the shadow in that single position. Um, and what's really great about this is you're going to do that and then come back a little bit later. Uh, into that exact same position. So if you're taping uh, the uh, piece of paper you're tracing on to the table and leaving the light alone, you can do that, or you can move the light afterwards. Um, but you, what's really great about this is you can do that first part of tracing, uh, go and do something like big sun, small moon to show that distance between that distance activity and come back. And when you trace your shadow in that new position after time has passed, what you'll see is the shadow has actually shifted. Um, if you're standing in the same position that you were when you traced your first shadow, what you'll notice is that depending on where you are on Earth, the shadow will have moved um, as the sun has traveled across the sky. Um, this is due to all us uh, spinning uh, and our Earth's rotation and uh, the sun, uh, our position on Earth being in a different position relative to the sun as time passes. Uh, so it shows how that path of the totality moves as the Earth's rotation moves and the sun, that shadow passes along the surface of the Earth during eclipse. So those two activities pair really, really well together, are really great hands-on kinesthetic learning acti uh, way activity. If you've got uh, middle grade kids or up elementary kids who are really uh, kinesthetic learners or body learners, these are really great activities to do uh, with those kids. Uh, can we move on to the next activity? And uh, this is another fantastic activity. It's great for all ages learners. This is Eclipse Chalk Art. Um, what this does is creates a model of solar features and coronal features. The corona is the, uh, you can see it in a lot of our uh, branding. Um, the light blue on this slide right here is kind of representing the corona. Uh, if you've ever seen a total eclipse before or a picture of the total eclipse, the corona is the kind of gaseous ejecta that uh, it takes place uh, around the sun. It's kind of the outermost uh, area of the sun. It's actually what we've sent the Parker Solar Probe through to measure for the first time, um, if you're doing any learning about the Parker Solar Probe in addition to the eclipse. Uh, but the uh, corona is only visible to our eyes during a total eclipse because the light of the sun covers that all up. So when the total eclipse happens, when the moon shadow passes in front of the sun at just that right distance, you're actually able to see this beautiful cloud of uh, radioactive material and gases, superheated gases and uh, particles being ejected from the sun in kind of the, uh, the, the area around the sun. And this eclipse chalk art uses a template that kind of represents the eclipse. And you trace, uh, uh, use a circular template to trace onto 
uh, a piece of paper and use some chalk um, to create uh, your version of uh, solar ejecta. Um, can we move on to the next slide? So here is a, a, a uh, chart that's actually included in the activity that talks about all sorts of different kind of coronal features. You have the huge corona itself, which is that outermost layer of the uh, solar atmosphere, and you've got prominences, which are the uh, little kind of bead looking things on the surface uh, of the or the uh, just at the edge of that uh, uh, the eclipse you see there. You've got plumes, um, coronal loops, um, and all of these are just magnetic and radioactive material that is being ejected from the sun that we can see during the eclipse. Um, and all you got to do is use a that stencil, you have a paper plate, um, a cardstock circle you cut out. You can use a uh, a tin can if you got like a big if you're uh, people who have donated recycled act, uh, materials uh, for craft activities. A big tin can of like tomatoes works really well for this. Um, but trace that uh, around on your paper um, with that chalk, and you can just use your finger to create uh, and push that chalk out. And what's great about that chalk is or a pastel would also work um, to create um, the prominences and those coronal features uh, and is a really great way to explore and uh, to use some art to explore some of these solar features. Um, and what's great about this is you can use white chalk art, but you can also get super creative. Think about um, if you wanted to go in the different spectrums of light, um, you could add, add different colors uh, to represent uh, those and explore the electromagnetic spectrum if you wanted to go a little deeper. Um, so you, there's a lot of ways to use this as a jumping off point for some cool creative solar art activities. Uh, so that is Eclipse Chalk Art. We'll move on to the next activity. Uh, which is building a sizzling solar oven. Uh, so this is a really, really cool activity. This is a bit of a more of a lift than the previous activities we've been talking about. Uh, but this is using um, any sort of pizza box. Um, I would recommend getting a clean one. Um, when I was creating uh, the materials and this how-to videos and prototyping this activity, I just went around to some local chain pizzerias, Domino's, Pizza Hut, I told them I was doing some educational programming around building a uh, pizza box solar oven. And uh, every location I went to was willing to give me like five to 10 boxes uh, to for free. Uh, they, 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 they just gave to me as a donation. So uh, uh, pretty easy to get that. Um, uh, some clean pizza boxes. And then you just need something to cut with, some plastic wrap. Uh, some tin foil, uh, something to prop the oven open, and then something to stick this all together, like some glue and tape. And how this works is this uses three scientific princi principles to create uh, something that is hot enough to cook some food out of a pizza box and some tin foil. So it uses reflection, absorption, and retention. So that foil lining reflects light off the sun. Uh, and then there is a black piece of paper in the bottom that adds as a heat sink that converts that light into heat energy. Uh, and then uh, there's a plastic film that covers that open spot on the top that retains that heat inside and allows the temperature to rise inside your solar oven uh, higher than the ambient temperature outside. Um, so we've actually got a diagram on the next slide to show how this works. Um, is uh, So you can see this is just like I described. We have the sun's light that comes in and reflects off of that flap that's covered in foil. Uh, and that foil refracts the light into the oven itself. Um, and when the black paper that's on the bottom uh, gets that light reflected onto it, because black is a pigment that re uh, that uh, doesn't reflect heat, it absorbs heat, um, that light energy is then converted to heat energy. Uh, and the plastic wrapper on top of that traps that energy in and cooks food. In this case, in this diagram, we're melting some s'mores. Uh, so really, really cool activity. Um, it doesn't quite get hot enough to cook uh, raw ingredients, uh, like I wouldn't try and uh, bake a chicken in your pizza box solar oven. Um, but uh, it's a really it gets warm enough to do things like melt chocolate, uh, melt marshmallows, melt cheese, um, which uh, brings us to uh, on the next slide, we've actually included three simple recipes in the activity uh, for you to use. Um, we have the nutty for solar science cookies, which these are simple egg free uh, cookies um, that are easily made uh, uh, completely, uh, these, the recipe itself is completely vegan, doesn't have dairy or eggs in it. Um, it's actually safe to eat. The batter is safe to eat on its own. So uh, all you need to do to cook these cookies is cook them through to the doneness you like. I like
like them just until the chocolate's melting. I like them kind of gooey, but I'm a cookie dough fan. Um, and it just uses banana, rolled oats, uh, any type of nut butter or seed butter. If you're concerned about uh, a uh, any uh, nut allergies, I mean, know peanut allergies are a really big thing right now uh are increasing in prominence so using something like a sun butter which is a sunflower butter um or any sort of seed butter um uh that would work really really well and then chocolate chips and you just mush that all together in a bowl shape it into cookies put it in your pizza oven and when they are firm and the chocolate chips are melty they're ready to eat we also have instructions for how to use uh this with s'mores um and what we're calling tortilla eclipse quesadillas um, which are veggie quesadillas that you can fill with any kind of filling or just cheese if you want and use your solar oven to melt the cheese on those quesadillas. Uh, and as Claire said in the chat, the sun butter would be very on brand uh, for the total eclipse. Um, and all of these instructions as any of the activities we're sharing today um, also have complete bilingual uh, Spanish uh, instructions as well. Uh, if we go to the next slide, you can see what that looks like in Spanish. Um, that Beatrice has uh, translated for us. So we also, because this makes a really great take and make activity or something you can send home uh, with your, your learners to do with their families. Um, this is a really great activity to do with a, uh, if you have a tween or teen uh, science or STEM club, um, this is a really great activity or craft to do uh, in uh, the library and send them home with their pizza box solar oven and these recipe cards. Uh, that they can uh, make the, these at home in preparation for the eclipse. Uh, so there's a cool take and make uh, component to this as well. And if you're trying to reach Spanish speaking families, like I said, all of these recipe cards are available uh, and the instructions are available in Spanish. Now, let's say you don't necessarily want to deal with food, but this activity sounds like a really cool one for you, or um, it's not a super bright sunny day as you're planning your uh, activity. Maybe you're doing this in the weeks leading up to the eclipse uh, as a cool way to distribute glasses and do some solar science education. But you're unfortunately in a, uh, it's partly cloudy that day and clouds keep passing in front of the sun. You're not quite gener generating quite enough solar energy to cook food. We have a we include an extension and kind of a backup activity in that instructional guide for you to turn your solar oven into a solar still. Um, a still is a uh, thing that purifies uh, any sort of liquid through evaporation. It's been used. Uh, it's used to purify water as well as to create alcohol spirits. The, the same kind of process of of purification through evaporation is how we get things like vodka and whiskey and bottled distilled water. Um, so uh, all you do is you build the solar oven the exact same way, but instead of filling it with uh, uh, a baking tray full of sun butter cookies or quesadillas, um, you put two containers inside, one of which uh, can, uh, the larger of which you fill with dirty water for when I've demonstrated this activity, I usually just take a little bit of potting soil and mix that in with water. So you see those big particles that are dirtying the water. Uh, and then you put a clean container uh, that's heavy enough to be weighed to the bottom of that uh, larger container fi uh, filled with dirty water. Then use some weights. In this case, I'd use stones uh, to kind of weigh down the plastic. And um, that's gonna, uh, the, the plastic sheeting on the solar oven. And what that'll do is create kind of a, a con uh, cave depression that when the you set up your solar oven, the water, the solar energy will heat the dirty water, evaporate the water molecules out of that dirty container, and they'll collect on that concave depression uh, in your solar oven. Uh, and as that water collects, it'll form condensation and that water will drip down into your clean container. And when you pull that clean container out, what you'll realize is that you've got pure water inside that container uh, that, uh, that doesn't have any of the particulate pollution that we put into the larger container on the outside. Uh, solar stills like this are you have been used to purify water uh, in uh, sunny desert environments um, for uh, for generations or uh, and for for, for, for for a very long time by people all across the world. Um, this is a really common technique. Um, sometimes people even use this to purify urine when they don't have uh, anything to drink in the desert. Um, and you know, if you have younger learners mentioning something like pee is always good for a giggle. So there's something you can mention there. 
Um, so there's this nice extension uh, that uh, to that solar oven activity, um, if you don't want to deal with food or there's a, a hiccup in your sunny day plans uh, for any Eclipse programming. So that's the bid, building a sizzling solar oven activity. Uh, and let's move on to the next activity, which is another really great one to do in preparation uh, for leading up to the eclipse. Uh, so uh, a lot of the libraries we've been working through through the SEAL project as we've been distributing uh, solar eclipse classes, or if you've gotten solar eclipse classes on your own, um, is that... <clears throat> A lot of people are just a lot of libraries are distributing these glasses in advance leading up to uh, the eclipse uh, in April. Uh, what the only problem there is that solar uh, glasses, the filters on the glasses need to be protected in order for them to maintain uh, their uh, coating and their filtration so that you're not able, you're not hurting your eyes or they're not developing holes, scratches uh, leading up to the eclipse, which can be very dangerous if you're looking at the eclipse with some uh, flawed eclipse glasses. Uh, so what we've done is we've created a printable personalized protective case uh, for keeping solar viewing glasses safe and dust free between the eclipses. It's really easily printable on cardstock. It's low cost. Um, it's an opportunity to discuss safe viewing uh, with your uh, patrons if you're distributing these glasses, the importance of keeping those dust free and in a safe place until the eclipse. Um, and because these solar uh, viewing glasses aren't just good for the eclipse, you can look at the sun anytime using them. This is also a great way for them to uh, keep these uh, if they want to use them again in the future. Um, so it's also commemorative, connects the two eclipse events, one the, the one in October uh, and the one uh, in April. Uh, and uh, it also makes a really, really fantastic take and make kit. We've had, uh, uh, because if you're distributing uh, glasses uh, through programming or you wanted to have these as something you can sign up and take, um, having this, the, the protective glasses case uh, as a printable and foldable is a really great way to come make your protective case, get a pair of glasses and come back and join us for Eclipse programming uh, is a really great take and make to, to send with folks as well. Um, so it can be a passive program, uh, take and make, really, really cool for all ages uh, and for families. You can give out one of these if you're distributing one set of glasses per family. Uh, you can hand these out with the glasses and or, or have them decorate them, make them. Um, if you wanted to retain the glasses uh, in-house, if you are using these for a select group of like repeated learners, like a STEM club, a teen or tween STEM club, uh, this is a really great option for them personalizing that. And you can also retain the glasses at your library and know who's or who's uh, as you redistribute those for Eclipse events. Can we move on to the next slide? Uh, as I said, these are it's low cost printable materials. If you're receiving the uh, solar viewing glasses from the SEAL program or another source, uh, this is a really great addition that all it costs is printing out some stuff on some cardstock. Uh, and the last activity, or the second to last activity we're gonna be talking about today uh, is, I'm sorry, I am rushing through. I'm just trying to get to all the activities we're going to, as I, uh, I know I'm talking a lot and very quickly, all of these, I just want to remind everyone that all these activities I'm talking about today are available in the link bank that Beatrice has been sharing out. Uh, and most of those activities have either have in-depth, step-by-step, full-color photo instructions on how to do these activities. Uh, and many of them also have how-to videos or recorded demonstrations from other webinars. Uh, so we have a lot of resources. I know I'm throwing a lot of these at you really quickly. We have a ton of resources available in that link bank to make sure you can run these activities uh, despite my rushed uh, get through all eight uh, uh, presentation today. Uh, so the next activity we're going to be talking about is uh, building your own solar eclipse viewer. Uh, now, I, as we were just talking about those uh, solar viewing glasses, uh, I know that we've distributed, uh, is it, it's over 5 million now glasses we've distributed through the SEAL program to libraries all across the country. I think we're, we've hit over 3,000 different libraries with uh, distributing those solar eclipse glasses. But there's never enough. Uh, you're, you'll just never have enough uh, for this total eclipse. I think it's the last one happening for a few decades that's viewable here in the US. Uh, there's going to be a lot of excitement about it. No matter how judicious you are about distributing those solar viewing glasses, you're probably not going to have enough for your event. Um, if we gave you a million, if we gave every library a million each, it would probably not be enough for uh, a total eclipse event. So we need to come up with some other ways to safely view the eclipse. 
uh, that aren't those solar filtration glasses. And one really great way is to use some simple materials to create a projector that you can safely view the eclipse that projects an image of the eclipse into a box. And uh, this activity walks you through that. It uses the principle of a camera obscura, um, if you've ever heard of that before, or a pinhole camera. Uh, and what that does is it takes the light that reflects off of an, uh, an object, and it concentrates it through a tiny hole called an aperture. Uh, and then through, this is the diagram on the bottom there. Uh, and once it's uh, concentrated through that aperture, a reversed image uh, of whatever the light is reflecting on through the, that aperture is projected uh, opposite the aperture. Uh, and so this is a, we have two kind of versions of how to make these kind of solar viewers, a very simple cereal box version, um, as well as a extension design challenge I'll be talking about in a bit to turn any kind of box into a safe viewer like this. Um, so some, all you really need is a strip of white paper, uh, some aluminum foil, craft, uh, craft knife or scissors, some tape, and for the basic version, a simple cereal box. Uh, can we move on to the next slide? And so you're going to create three different elements uh, to your uh, solar eclipse viewer. A projection screen, something that will be opposite your aperture, um, that it, the image of the eclipse can be projected on. An aperture, which we're going to create out of uh, some tin foil and just poking a tiny hole. And then a viewing window that allowed that is also opposite uh, the uh, the aperture that lets you view the projection of the eclipse. And those are the three essential parts of a pinhole viewer. And all of the background science explainers of how the this works um, and how to build these are available in the activity guide that's in that link bank. Um, so you can create many different designs from any box. The instructions, the step-by-step -step instructions we have in the activity guide use a cereal box, uh, but the, uh, the, you can use this out of any box at all. Um, so it's a really great opportunity to get people to donate recycled materials leading up to a program. Um, if you've got things like craft paper, scissors, and tape around, having uh, people bring, uh, bring your own box to, the, uh, to your event if you're building any of these, uh, it's a great way to save on some materials cost and get your community involved with uh, donating uh, materials. Let's move on to the next slide. Uh, so uh, you, the first step is to open up one end of the box, put that projection screen like we did uh, on the previous slide. Uh, opposite that projection screen, you're going to cut out uh, the, uh, the a hole in that, so two holes in that side, one for the viewing window, one for the aperture. You're going to cover one hole uh, with the aluminum foil and poke a hole and then you look through the and then uh, once you've done that you tape that all shut you aim the aperture at the the eclipse and what you'll see is uh, you can move the angle around and eventually if you get the angle right you will see a projection of the eclipse on the projection screen through that viewing window. Um, and what you'll see is uh, if you hold that and you kind of track the eclipse with that viewing window, which will be behind you if you're holding it like so, uh, you can track and see the uh, that projection of the moon shadow covering the sun uh, as you see in this photo. Um, uh, next slide, please. And there's also a really great way to turn this into while the step-by-step -step instructions are for a cereal box, uh, you can use any sort of box, uh, and that viewing window doesn't need to be next to the aperture either. Uh, this is an example of one I designed for an engineering design challenge where you can see here on the in, in um, box number four, the viewing window is on the left side of the box, and the aperture is actually on uh, the side perpendicular to it. Uh, so I'm still viewing, I'm, instead of viewing it side by side, the aperture, I can actually look through the side because it's a larger box. Um, I've also, this was an older box, so you can kind of see in that fourth box there, you can use things like black construction paper or tape to cover up holes uh, on your box to create even more of a light, uh, uh, a lightless box for that projection to be even clearer. Uh, so if, especially if you've got some older learners, you're doing some family uh, all ages events with uh, maybe some families that have some teens and younger uh, learners, this kind of design challenge is a great way to get older learners involved with younger learners and everybody to work together to build a cool uh, eclipse viewer that can uh, be safely used to view the eclipse and is an excellent way uh, to uh, safely view the eclipse and have multiple people be watching the eclipse even if you don't have enough glasses. Uh, so now we'll move on to the last activity, 
um, which is sorting games, how big, how far, how hot. Um, we've been referencing a couple of times the state library solar science circulation kits uh, in most of the in almost every state. I think we only didn't get to like three or four um, there. We have worked with state libraries to create uh, two different solar science kits that have uh, telescopes, uh, books, hands on activities uh, included in them. And this is one of the activities that's actually included in one of the kits, the sorting games, how big, how far, how hot. Um, it's a really great warm up. The activity guide has instructions on how to do this uh, for both virtual programming and in-person programming. Uh, one of the things we're doing through the SEAL program, if SEAL program is making solar eclipse experts available uh, for libraries to come and do all sorts of events, both virtual and in-person. This makes an excellent warm up for a virtual event um, as uh, you all really only need the images uh, and you don't really, uh, you, uh, you, you doesn't rely on the in-person cards, but the in-person printable cards or the printed laminated cards that are included in the solar science kit make it a really, really cool hands-on activity as well. Um, so you work together to sort the cards into uh, orders from uh, a, for different uh, types of uh, characteristics. The green border cards, you sort by size from smallest to largest. The blue border in distance, closest to farthest from Earth. And the red border is temperature, coldest to hottest. Uh, and there are two sets of cards for each one of these categories. There's kind of an easier uh, version and a uh, a harder version uh, that, that is included in those activities. So you can start with one as a warm up and then move to something more difficult. Or if you're doing repeated programming, uh, you can uh, go ahead and uh, run this multiple times as a warm up. And it's a really great way to get people thinking about space, about uh, the different aspects of it, and is a repeatable activity as well. Um, so I think we've got just a couple minutes for me to run through an example of this. Uh, so I would love for y'all to put the answers in the chat, um, but we're going to sort these green cards. This is the kind of easier version of the green cards, uh, this which is the size category. And we're going to sort these objects from smallest to largest. So go ahead and throw in the chat, uh, what's the smallest object on this list? Beatrice and Claire, y'all don't get to answer because I know you've seen me do this many times. So... Are getting some answers coming in. Lions, absolutely. That was kind of a gimme. Um, lions would have to fit on all four of uh, the other objects. So yeah, lions are the smallest. Uh, can anyone tell me what the next smallest object is between the moon, Mars, Earth, and the International Space Station? I'll give you a hint. In order for one object to be in orbit around another, it's got to be smaller than that object it's orbiting. So we've got a couple of things that orbit. Yeah, absolutely, uh, Lisa and Cesar. The, uh, the International Space Station is the next uh, smallest object on this list. Um, it is slightly smaller than the next smallest object, which is another thing that orbits the Earth, which should give this away. Uh, and anybody want to take a stab at what the kind of middle, uh, right in the middle in terms of size? The moon, absolutely. Uh, the moon is much larger than the ISS, but much smaller than the Earth. And, and as we were talking about earlier, is just the right size to create the perfect size shadow to create a total eclipse uh, as it passes between us and the sun uh, at specific times. So we've got two objects left. Um, Mars and Earth. Now, which one of these is bigger, Mars or Earth? I will give you a hint and say that one of these objects has, a, a, between Earth and Mars, one of those planets has a lot of something the other one doesn't that makes it slightly, uh, to have a more mass. Um, so what do you think is smaller between Mars and Earth? Absolutely. We're getting some answers from Mars coming in. Um, while Mer Mars and Earth have about the same amount of uh, rocky land mass, uh, the Earth is covered in oceans, um, which uh, makes it about approximately a third uh, uh, bigger in mass uh, than Mars, which also means that Mars has slightly less gravity uh, than Earth um, because of that uh, less mass. Uh, so that's an example. This was uh, obviously easy to do virtually. Um, you can also really do this with the printed cards uh, as a nice warm up. Uh, because of the multi levels of difficulty uh, and different categories, 
Um, size uh, is really easy to do with younger learners. Temperature might require a little bit more background knowledge that, to scaffold off of for a middle or a high school learner or adult learners. Uh, but a really cool, easy warm up um, that lets you sound super smart for knowing all this information beforehand uh, and uh, providing that for, for your learners. Uh, so those are the hands-on activities um, that uh, we're talking about today. Like I said, all of these are available in Spanish as well as English. Uh, and I will pass this back along to Claire to talk about some of the uh, tools uh, that we also have uh, uh, available for you uh, to beyond the hands-on activities to kind of talk about the eclipses. So take it away, Claire. All right, so there are all kinds of tools that you can find out there to safely view the sun. We're just going to be talking about two of them, one that we developed in-house um, and another one that you can order if you don't have one. Um, it's a sun spotter, um, but it's also available in those solar science kits that most state libraries now have if you want to check them out um, for your solar science programs. So the first one is a constellation card um, that shares the story of a Maya constellation called the Seven Maca, um, or Siete Guacamayo. Um, this, as you can see, you probably recognize this constellation. Um, the Greek version of the constellation is the Big Dipper, but um, in the Guatemalan highlands, uh, the Maya uh, culture had a different, slightly different perspective of this constellation. Um, it's much more vertical facing from where they were and where they are, um, the, where the Guatemalan highlands are on the earth. Um, this constellation actually over at night appears to dip beneath the horizon of the earth and then come back up uh, during the night. So um, if, if you're in that area ever and you want to stargaze all night, you kind of see this constellation go beyond the horizon and then back up. Um, and so a story, uh, you know, of their cosmology was um, created from this observation that they had of this particular constellation. So um, the card comes with that story. Um, and also, uh, so this is available in English and, and Spanish as well. Um, so in the Seven Macaw story, it's actually a bird, not a dipping tool. Um, and this bird is made up of these, these bright stars. And in their constellation story, this bird is, is very in vain. You know, I'm so beautiful. Look at my bright stars. Um, and so in their constellation story, origin story um that dis that dipping going underneath the horizon kind of um is explained by well this bird was being punished you know for being so dazzling for being so bright they got kind of pulled into the underworld um as punishment for its vanity so um just a fun way to explore other cultures you know i think it's so often we only hear about um at least in my circles, we we focus so much on that Greco-Roman constellation stories, um, but cultures all around the world have their own stories of what they observed in the night sky in relating in relation to what their culture is. You know, we all view uh, the world through the lens of our cultural experience. So um, a fun way to bring in some multicultural stories. Um, and then it's also a tool you can use for the eclipse. If you have a hole puncher, um, you can just punch the stars in the constellation and then use that as you'll have seven little pinhole projectors that you can use on the day of the eclipse or any day. Um, we put this in a kit and the um, the hole punch we used was actually star shaped. You can get different types of shapes of, of hole punchers. Um, and what's fun about that is uh, when you hold the card down on the sidewalk, um, really close to the sidewalk, first you'll see lights shining through in the shape of the stars. Um, if you use that star-shaped hole punch. But as you lift it up and move it sort of away from the ground, um, it will act in the same way as the, the camera, obscure, camera obscura concept that Dylan was talking about, and it will invert the image of the sun. And so you'll see those little star shapes turn into a circle if it's just a regular day. And that's kind of exciting. You can use it anytime. Um, but on the day of the eclipse, you'll see the star shapes be inverted into that crescent shape um, as there's a partial eclipse and then eventually you won't see anything at all because the sun will be completely covered. Um, but yeah, a fun way to bring in some um, Maya culture um, as well as using a scientific tool uh, to safely indirectly view the sun. 
Um, and the next one is a sunspotter. So this is a fantastic indirect way of viewing the sun. It, it works similarly to a pinhole projector, but it comes with a series of um, uh, uh, mirrors that reflect the sun. Um, and then, so the, the mirrors kind of reflect the sun through the its main viewing hole here. Um, and they, the reflection bounces off a mirror here to the other corner of the, the this triangle um, contraption. Um, and then up to a final mirror on the very top that projects the image through a magnifying glass. So while the pinhole projectors are great because you can see the sun, it appears really, really small because there's no magnification of that image. Um, so this will magnify an indirect view of the sun. Um, and you can see it here magnified on a piece of white paper that is the sun. Um, and through this, you can see, since it's so magnified, you can see a lot of those features that Dylan was talking about, um, you can see sunspots. Um, sometimes you can see little prominences off of on the side. Um, and this is great because you can have kids gather around it. It's not one person using the tool. Multiple people can view the image at the same time. Um, and if you have little kids, you can turn this into an art project. You know, invite them to come and trace um, on that piece of paper the sun and where they see the sunspots. And then they can take that home and... Um, uh, bring a little bit of art into this as well. So the Sunspotter itself comes with instructions in English um, and they're actually printed on the side of that triangle contraption. I'm sure there's a better word for it, but it's not coming to my head right now. Um, so Beatrice translated that for you. So um, in the link bank, um, you can download a copy of the Spanish translation of the instructions for how to use a Sunspotter, um, pass that around, um, for folks that that um, uh, would prefer to 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 read about this, you know, these scientific concepts and instructions in the language that they're most comfortable in, um, so that's a way you can increase that accessibility. Um, if you do not have a sunspotter and you want to get one, they're running at about between five hundred and six hundred dollars, um, and there is a link to purchase it if you have the funds on that link bank or reach out to your state library and see if you can check one out for your solar science programs. All right, and with that, we are at three minutes left of the program. So uh, we'll open it up to you all. If you have any questions, um, please, you can feel free to unmute yourself to ask questions, put it in the chat, um, or if you have other resources that you think people here would benefit from um, that are solar science related, solar eclipse related, or resources around science in Spanish, um, we'll feel free to share that in the chat as well. One thing I learned about the Sunspotter, Claire, is that it's actually called a Keplerian style telescope. Um, because it uses a singular optical lens uh, to create a inverted image uh, oh. on the sun. So that is that is different than a dual lens uh, uh, my, uh, telescope, like the kind you would see in many observatories. Awesome. Keplerian. I'm adding that to my vocabulary today. <laughs> I swear, we've been doing these solar science and solar eclipse webinars and trainings for over a year and I I still learn something new um from my colleagues and from people in the audience so which is a really cool opportunity to talk about what a great opportunity the eclipses are for co-learning with your community uh there's never you know whether or not you're inviting a solar eclipse expert or just engaging with the community and doing these kind of uh hands-on activities you never know who's going to bring different knowledge uh, to your programs uh, and share cool things. So this is uh, this is such a great, the eclipses and the sun are such a, you know, we all interact with the sun every single day in some way. Uh, talking and learning about the sun is a really, really great way to have some baseline uh, uh, science learning with your community and learn yourself as well. Absolutely. Well, thank you all so much for joining. Uh, we'll stick around for one more minute if any questions come up, but uh, you can find the recording and the slides and the link bank on the StarNet webinars archive page after it'll probably be available in about a day or two. 
And because this is, uh, if you want to check out our webinars page, um, we also are doing on March 12th, um, a uh, cult viewing the eclipses through uh, the cultural lens. Um, so if you are in a heavily Spanish speaking cultural community, we're having a guest speaker from the Exploratorium coming and talking about some of the cool programming they did in October for the annular eclipse uh, with Latina communities. Um, so if you're interested in that, be sure to check out our webinars page on starnetlibraries.org uh, and sign up for that webinar as well. All right. Thank you all so much. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks for joining us all.